Okay, so I'm, uh, we're continuing to read uh, John Hoglund's essay on uh, Truth Infinitude, Heidegger's Transcendental Existentialism. Let's go back here. Um, okay, so we had just talked about the uh, generalization. He's talking about, um, John Hoglund's talking about two of Heidegger's important uh, concepts or or characteristic words, which are entities and um, and comportment, which are generalizations uh, of Kant's objects and Husserl's, um, Husserl's intentionality, respectively. Um, so, now we're coming up on Dasein. Dasein is Heidegger's word for what essentially distinguishes the human from the non-human, whether animate or inanimate. This is not definitive of Dasein, but only an indication of its evident scope. In other words, it is not ruled out that there are many there, that there may be non-human Dasein, perhaps on other planets. But we don't know of any. It is definitive of Dasein that it is the entity that understands being, hence can comport itself toward entities as entities. This is not the most basic definition of Dasein, but it follows from it. Thus, Dasein is a distant successor of the Logos and the immortal soul, and a not-so-distant distant successor of the transcendental subject or spirit. As it happens, I disagree with most readers of Heidegger about the individuation of Dasein. In particular, I don't think there is a separate and unique Dasein for each person. But that won't make that won't matter for most of what follows, so I won't discuss it except in passing. Dasein's essential characteristic, as the entity that understands being, is what Heidegger calls disclosedness. This is our fourth word, disclosedness. I'm going to argue that disclosedness is a, is a successor, albeit fundamentally transformed, of Kant's transcendental apperception. Now, apperception, for Kant, is consciousness of an object that is, or at least could be, conscious of itself as a conscious of that subject, or of that object. Or so let's, let's, let's define how, let's state again how Hoglund defines Kant's apperception, which, uh, which is a, what disclosedness is essentially a transformation of, of that, of Kant's concept of apperception. Uh, transcendental apperception. Apperception for Kant is consciousness of an object that is, or at least could be, conscious of itself as conscious of that object. Apperceptive consciousness is the consciousness that is distinctive and pre prerequisite to the possibility of synthetic judgment, hence of empirical knowledge. In particular, the fact that it could be conscious of itself in being conscious of an object is prerequisite to the possibility of its being conscious of the object as an object at all. This is why apperception is transcendental. So in order to be conscious of this object as an for Kant as an object, so to be conscious of this uh, E, this ebook reader as an ebook reader, I have to also have in that consciousness the uh, a kind of awareness or possibility for awareness of my my myself as conscious of this object. So this is a two-way thing. You're conscious of the object, and you're conscious that it is you yourself who is now conscious of that object. That's a two part. That's apperception, transcendental apperception. And the transcendental part is it is of the apperception, the transcendental uh, qualifier there means that it is, that if you, if you aren't, if that isn't possible, if that uh, isn't a characteristic of that consciousness, that it is both conscious of itself and, or of, of the object and of itself, at least possibly, then if you don't have that two-way thing going on, then you can't be 
you know, you can't be conscious of objects as objects at all. And that's the transcendental means. It's the condition you have to have, the condition for the possibility of something else. So tra transcendental apperception. There are many conspicuous and important differences between disclosedness and apperception. So here's where Heidegger and his concept of disclosedness and Kant's concept of apperception part ways. I mentioned several in a footnote to a later passage. The reason that I nevertheless want to emphasize their kinship is that disclosedness has the same sort of interdependent duality in what it is of that apperception has. Any disclosing is at once a disclosing of Dasein itself and a disclosing of the being of entities. He said the being of entities, not entities, but the being of entities. So that's, that's an important distinction. So Dasein, and, any disclosing is at once a disclosing of Dasein itself and a disclosing of the being of entities. It could not be either without being also the other. It could not be either without being also the other. But as we shall see, disclosing the being of entities is the condition of the possibility of any comportment toward them as entities. And moreover, this depends on the fact that it is always with a self, it is always also a self-disclosing. Therefore, disclosedness too is transcendental and for a structurally similar reason. One disanalogy, however, is quite fundamental. So here's where they really that was their kinship. Here's where they part. This is where they part ways with their concept. Whereas apperception, as self-conscious, is conscious also of objects. Disclosedness, as self-disclosing, does not disclose also entities, but rather the being of entities. This is not a minor difference. If there is any single thesis that can be picked out as Heidegger's most emphatic, basic and original, it is this. The being of entities is not itself an entity. Signed in Zeit 6. This expresses what he calls the ontological difference. The difference between being and entities. It is the central thought of Heidegger's Heideggerian philosophy. Kant could not have seen this profound difference between apperception and disclosedness because he did not thematize the difference between being and entities. For the same reason, Kant could not have raised the question of being. Heidegger claims that, apart from a few dark glimpses, all of his predecessors since the earliest Greeks have forgotten the question of being, and he has an account of how and, and why that happened. But he also claims that the disclosedness of being, as self-disclosing too, is the condition of the possibility of any comportment toward entities as entities. That is why the question of being now needs to be reawakened, the principal aim of being in time. Thus, disclosedness lies at the heart of the whole project. It is all too easy to get baffled and intimidated, not to say exasperated, by the way Heidegger talks about being. But that's not necessary. The basic idea is in fact fairly straightforward. The being of entities is that in terms of which they are intelligible as entities. So we'll say that again. The being of entities is that in terms of which they are intelligible as entities. The qualifier as entities, as I'm using it, is short for this. With regard to the fact that they are at all, and with regard to what they are. So, as entities, when, when he says that be, the being of entities is that in terms of which they are intelligible as entities, the last part, as entities, means with regard to the fact that they are, and, or at all, and with regard to what they are. Understanding an entity as an entity, and there is no other way of understanding it, means understanding it 
in its that it is and its what it is. Disclosing the, be disclosing the being of entities amounts to letting them become accessible in this twofold intelligibility, that is, as phenomena that are understood. When taken with sufficient generality, a pretty good colloquial paraphrase for disclosing the being of is making sense of. I can illustrate and clarify this by reciting a familiar special case. Consider the entities that are investigated by fundamental mathematical physics. Electrons, quarks, photons, the properties or states they can have, the basic forces by which they interact, and so on. Okay, we'll, we'll continue this in another video because that's a, it's a pretty important part and uh, I don't want to make these too long as individual uh, videos go.